speculators who tend to be bullish. Um, if they're not bullish, they tend to have lower long positions on a net basis. And on the other side, you have the bullion banks who will um, tend to go short, and they can go short quite easily because it's just a question of expanding um, uh, their balance sheets. Um, they just go short. They can print contracts out of thin air. And usually what happens is they do that to the extent where they overwhelm uh, the the um, uh, uh, the hedge fund managers. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the price gets uh, driven down. Now, recently, we've had quite an interesting divergence between what's been going on in the gold market and what's been going on in the silver market. In the gold market, um, this level of... Um, uh, if you like, outstanding contracts, what we call open interest, has not built up to the sort of levels where you would expect uh, the the overall bullishness amongst the hedge fund fund managers to get out of control, out of proportion, and therefore vulnerable to a massive correction. That hasn't happened yet. But on the other hand, if you look at the silver market, uh, the open interest rate has recently been at record levels. I mean, you know, this, these, these are extremely high levels. They indicate that uh, the hedge funds are very, very long of silver. Uh, and there you would expect that there would be a shakeout because no bullion bank likes to sit on um, really enormous losses and losses building as more and more contracts. They issue more and more contracts on the short side to find that they're bought and the price still goes up. Now, in favor of the bullion banks, actually what's happened with silver is that the price has underperformed despite this enormous expansion in open interest rates. So, uh, in open interest. So, it, this is... Um, uh, a, a sort of rather unusual situation where on the one hand you would say in shorthand that gold is not yet overbought but on the other hand you would say that silver is very overbought i'm not quite sure what it means but i think what it does tell me about the gold market is that the gold market uh, has the potential to rise further before it gets into that overbought uh, technically overbought territory whereas the silver market there is something going on which i don't fully understand understand. Um, I've had a look at the underlying numbers, and I can't even turn around and say that there's a someone's trying to corner the market or anything like that. It really doesn't look like that. But if you look at the underlying supply and demand for silver, uh, you can see that silver is demanded. Of that, there is no doubt. And there is probably not a lot of room for um, uh, investment interest in silver, as it were, uh, in in the physical. So um, it's it's a it's a funny old game, really, because silver is is you know maybe more aligned with uh, the base metals in the way it's moving, whereas gold is definitely monetary, and that at the moment is an extremely interesting situation with all the geopolitical stuff going on. Plus the fact that uh, the interest rates, term interest rates in the United States have been falling recently. So gold is, I think, at a very in interesting juncture at this moment. Now, I was wondering, um, do you, so what do you see for the silver market? The open interest is just going super high, but the price of silver isn't really reacting at all. So what do you see for the short term future of the silver market? Do you know, I really don't know what to make of it. Um, what I do know uh, moving away from the technicals in uh, the futures markets is I do know that demand for silver is very strong. And it's very strong because China is buying up uh, raw materials, the base metals, uh, the metals it needs for industrial purposes, because it is expanding its economy at a fair clip. I mean, the re recently they said that their economic growth was running at about 6.9%, which was better than anybody thought. I don't actually place too much credence on these figures, but I think it is indicative of the, of, uh, of the fact that the Chinese economy is actually growing quite strongly. Uh, they are also trying to get rid of um, uh, excess dollars and U.S. treasuries in return for physical uh, metals, um, energy, all those things because of their plans for developing the whole of Asia. So you can see that, um, you know, the demand for silver is there in the physical market. But what I can't quite uh, rationalize in my own mind is why the price isn't higher in the futures market, except possibly 
it has been depressed deliberately by uh, the bullion banks at someone's behest. Now, that I wouldn't know. That is getting into the realms of speculation. But it certainly sp smells as if the futures market is sitting on the price while we know that there is very good demand uh, out there from uh, particularly countries like China. And remember, China is now the largest um, uh, manufacturer of uh, solar panels. Uh, that market's increasing very, very sharply. Um, it's also used in chemicals for synthesizing chemicals. And that, again, is another area where China has been sort of pretty pretty active and china also refines an awful lot of silver i i, I expect also that um we're seeing jewelry demand in places like india um because of all the problems that uh, have been um uh, uh, if you like brought about uh, on gold by uh, the modi government perhaps the indians are buying silver perhaps silver is being bought elsewhere as well because it is seen in asia as uh, as a form of money uh, and is therefore attractive on that um, on that basis definitely now i'd like to discuss a little bit regarding the situation with korea right now and how it might impact the precious metal markets now just discussing the situation right now you you've been saying that the korean situation is escalating out of control and there might be no way to stop it can you expand on that well um, i think more correctly i said there is a risk that that is the, the is that that is how it will be viewed um i think that the north korean situation is being um pumped up by um the u.s government um the fact of the matter is that the north koreans will be perfectly happy to meet the Americans uh, on the basis that they become accepted more in the global community. We've had so many signals from North Korea that that's what they want. But it is the Americans that have refused to accommodate them, saying that they've got to uh, get rid of their nuclear we weapons, they have to stop that program, and so on and so forth. So it's the Americans who are playing hardball. It's actually not the North Koreans. I would say that uh, Kim Jong-un is a very frightened, paranoid dictator. And uh, in that sense, he is probably unpredictable. But the situation could be resolved tomorrow by America just saying, well, you know, let's just back off for a moment. Let's consider this and perhaps let's have a conference and talk about it. That would give uh, Kim Jong-un the sense of importance that he feels he is lacking, the respect he is lacking from the international community. So it's actually quite easy to solve. So this raises the question, why is America destabilizing the North, uh, North Korea and, and uh, if you like, the whole of that region? Because bear in mind that both Vladivostok and Beijing are within the nuclear fallout of anything that happens in, in North Korea. So uh, this is a situation which um, is actually looking pretty dangerous. Um, whether it escalates any further or not, we don't know. In the past, what tends to have happened is that you get a lot of saber rattling. You get a few missiles launched. Um, you know, perhaps they attack a fishing boat or something. Uh, they attack some, you know, they do something on the border with South Korea, which is seen as aggressive. And then the whole thing calms down. Um, I think that's what pe people are hoping this time. But I'm not too sure. I think the Americans are actually a bit more serious about this, which raises the question why they're doing it. And I think they're doing it for um, a an interesting reason, which has been uh, put up by the Chinese military strategists as uh, the way America behaves. Basically, um, America prints dollars for export, and um, it makes a lot of money out of printing dollars for export. Obviously, you've got the seniorage uh, of the raw of the raw stuff, and also you've got the seniorage, if you like, of the bank credit expansion, uh, where uh, U.S. banks lend uh, dollars. Now, uh, one of the regions in the world where there are lots of dollar dollars around is, of course, in the ownership of South Koreans and also um, uh, the Japanese. So. Um, uh, could it be that what America is now doing is that it needs to borrow um, dollars at, uh, without raising interest rates uh, in America because of the, the overall levy, level of outstanding debt? Um, now, it can do that by making everything else look risky compared with U.S. Treasuries. So that's the first leg of it. The second leg of the, the argument is that uh, we're up against the debt ceiling, um, and that is uh, a very, very serious, hard uh, fact that, we're, that, that um, uh, Trump is facing at the moment. Um, however, 
the one way in which you'll get Congress to support an increase in the debt ceiling is in a war situation. So if Trump can go to Congress and say, look, this, there is a, you know, this is a war situation. Hopefully it's not going to deteriorate into a war, into, into a real war, but I need the, I need the room in order to be able to, um, to look after uh, America's interests. So that, you know, that I can see as being a very powerful argument because very few congressmen are going to stand in the way of, um, uh, if you like, the national interest in that sense. So, um, this is the way the Chinese strategists are looking at it. They see this as a war being manufactured by the United States to do two things. First of all, to increase the apparent risk on investments in the region. And we're talking about not North Korea, but South Korea and also uh, um, uh, Japan. And the second thing is that Trump needs to get Congress to agree to an increase in the debt limit. And in a war situation, they will agree a lot more readily than they would without, you know, in, in, in a peaceful situation. So that's that, I think, is the explanation behind what's happening in North Korea. Now, hopefully that is right in the sense that um, it's going to go no further than is necessary, if you like, to achieve those two objectives. Um, but it is actually quite troubling in the sense that I think afterwards, uh, both Japan and South Korea will have seen that they have suffered very badly from these actions, which amount to absolutely nothing at the end of the day. And the thought that they will be on side with America in future, I think we've got to take a step back and say, well, their vested interest is to ditch America and actually go throw in their lot with China, which is which is growing rapidly. It's got far more interests. Furthermore, uh, Japanese co uh, companies have large investments in China. They've got a lot of manufacturing um, uh, capacity uh, in China and in, and in Southeast Asia. The whole of that region is actually where Japan's focus increasingly is and will be. And I think the same is also true of South Korea. So I think, um, you know, this sort of idea of a strategy to pump and dump dollars um, and recover them or pump and dump the economies, if you like, of America's friends in order to support the U.S. economy. I think this is the last time that it's going to happen. Uh, so it's actually quite a serious situation from that point of view. The underlying thing is that what we're seeing is not a military war, but a financial war. Now, how do you see this all impacting the precious metal markets? Well, um, the precious metals markets are, I mean, very heavily managed. I think that's the first thing we've got to say. I think what China um, is going to do eventually uh, is she is going to uh, basically move commodities onto a gold uh, payments standard. Uh, and that she can do quite easily because what she is doing, uh, the first thing she has done in, in Shanghai is she has uh, permitted the setting up of uh, Chinese yuan futures contracts in gold. So that what you can do is if you, let us say, receive Chinese yuan as part of a trade deal and you want to um, reduce your exposure to it, you can sell it forward on that or sell, sell the futures uh, and then deliver into those futures and get gold. That's the first thing. The second contract, which uh, was going to be established in this, but has actually been put on hold, is an, is, uh, uh, um, an oil contract, futures contract, denominated in yuan. Now, when that comes in, and this is something the Chinese, I think, have realized, and which is why they put it on hold, what will happen is that energy uh, uh, suppliers, I mean, for example, uh, in the Middle East, who supply a lot of China's energy now, uh, they are likely to um, uh, sell their oil to China, receive yuan, and uh, sell those yuan forward for gold. Now they will be able to, once the gold contract, the, the oil contract is there, as soon as they have got the, 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 you know, the oil contract or as soon as they know that they're going to be supplying oil, they don't need to wait for the yuan to be received. They can effectively uh, deal straight through 
two contracts and receive gold for their oil. Now, that puts oil or energy back onto um, a gold price. And that is going to be absolutely the end as far as the dollar is concerned. This is why the Chinese have held off. They've held off because they are not ready to pull the trigger on that one. So do you see them holding off for a lot longer? I mean, how long do you think they will continue to hold off and, you know, keep propping up the dollar? Um, I think that it's, I mean, North Korea, if, start, if that starts going wrong, then they could start pulling the trigger to stop America, basically. Uh, if, on the other hand, um, they are just sort of going on their normal course of, uh, of, of uh, economic planning, then I suspect it will be within the next couple of years. Um, one of the things that they will want to do is they will want to sell more of their U.S. treasuries for uh, commodities. Uh, U.S. treasuries, as far as they're concerned, have no value. Um, they were just a counterpart of uh, their management of their own currency. So they want to ditch that in return for hard commodities and energy. Um, so I think that's probably something that they will be looking to do over a two-year time phrase, uh, time, uh, time scale. There is not much point in them doing it any um, uh, doing it any more rapidly because they can't sell them into the market more rapidly. And not only that, but uh, they then have the equation to work out at what price will gold have to be for us to compensate on our losses on our U.S. treasuries and our U.S. dollars in reserve. And, uh, you know, you're then looking at something. You're then talking about a price of, I don't know, take a number out of thin air, you know, sort of three or four thousand dollars an ounce. Um, and uh, I don't I mean that you see, that's a bit of a nuclear option. If you're going to do that, you're going to not only um, uh, destabilize the Western economies, but you're going to create a banking system at the heart of, um, of money, the sound money, the banks that owe sound money, the banks that have unallocated accounts for their customers, the banks that um, uh, owe gold under lease back to central banks. Suddenly the whole situation gets very, very nasty and bullion banks have to be bailed out and so on and so on. So that is something I think that, I mean, China understands how serious such a move will be. She's not going to do it lightly. Um, and uh, in any event, uh, uh, when she reduces her exposure to the US dollar and when uh, the yuan has become more marketable, that is the time in which she would ideally do it. And I think that's about two years away. Now, on Sunday, there were the French elections. I'd like to move our focus to those because um, there's potentially... Uh, geopolitically destabling event that could happen in the near future. With the French elections on Sunday, we saw Marine Le Pen and Emmanuel Macron. Um, it was the first round of voting, and those two basically are then going to uh, face off in another round of voting soon. So what is your perspective on this? Because Marine Le Pen is a far-right candidate who is anti-EU. I was just interviewing John Rubino, and he was saying that if Marine Le Pen won – this could possibly, this would be very, very bad for the future of the European Union. What is your perspective right now? I mean, it, it seems like a pretty unlikely chance because polls are showing that uh, Emmanuel Macron would be about 20 points ahead uh, facing off against Marine Le Pen. But um, what is your perspective if we did see some sort of, like we saw with Trump um, getting elected and like we saw with Brexit where the polls were wrong, um, and there was this upset. If we saw that same kind of thing with Marine Le Pen becoming France's president, what do you think that would mean for the future of the EU? Well, I think it would be a far greater shock than anything we've seen so far. Um, uh, France is integral to the whole of the EU. The two powerhouses in the EU through thick and thin have always been Germany and France. And it was set up that way so that those two countries would never go at war again. So, so I think that's the first thing to say. Now, looking at um, the structure of the election, uh, the way the presidential election works in France is it is designed by this two stage process to eliminate extremists from ever becoming president. And we're seeing this in action uh, now uh, in that um, immediately we have a situation where uh, uh, Marine Le Pen, let us, I mean, if, let us assume that she got 30 percent of the votes, uh, for, for example. In fact, she got just under 24 percent. But if she got 30 percent, 30 percent uh, and uh, uh, Macron, um, say, got 
let's say you know 20 odd and uh you know but the, the other there was another one in the running and they had to have a uh, another um, uh, you know another round they've got to have another round that on the results that have happened but let's assume that Marine Le Pen was in the lead and still there would have to be round two now under those circumstances all the other uh, candidates who have lost would uh, try and persuade their supporters to vote against Marine Le Pen in other words they would go for the other the other guy if it was a far, far left uh, um, uh, individual, again, it would be the same thing. You know, if a communist stood um, and a communist got to, let us say, sort of even, uh, you know, joint first or, you know, maybe slightly ahead of, um, of, of, of number two, under those circumstances, again, everybody would turn around and say, don't vote for the communist, vote for the other guy. Now, to the extent that they can deliver those votes, and uh, they can to a large degree, not totally, but to a large degree they can deliver those votes, it guarantees that the extremist does not become president. And that's the situation that Marine Le Pen finds herself in. It's not impossible um, that she will be elected, but I think it's unlikely. Now, having said that, the way I look at the EU is that it doesn't necessarily depend on um, something which is predictable, like, um, you know, a French election or a Dutch election or even Germany's election coming in later on this year. Um, it doesn't necessarily depend on something predictable like the Italian banking system getting into a crisis. Well, we already know it's in a crisis, but the crisis is becoming, um, you know, considerably more manifest. Um, I think what's likely to happen with the EU is... It's actually a long process of um, of falling apart. And uh, I mean, what we will know is that if Marine Le Pen is denied this time, next time, she or someone like her, anti-EU, will probably have a damn good chance of becoming president. So what we're talking about is not the inevitable um, being stopped, but the inevitable only being delayed. So that's the way I would look at it. And I think that um, it will be maybe a matter of no more than uh, a week or so before we forget about all this. Um, and, uh, you know, we start concentrating on the other risks. I mean, we've been talking about North Korea. I think that risk is going to come back. And I think that's going to hit us in spades. Um, so, you know, the EU is a continuing deteriorating situation. And I think what we've seen is we've we, we, we've sort of got over um, a speed bump, if you like, in that downhill run. Um, and that's the way I'd look at all these things. Eventually, the thing is going to collapse. I have no doubt about that, because it is so, um, uh, um, if you like, it is so uh, wealth destructive, uh, that it will not survive uh, in, in the long run. Um, so but I think that's the way I'd look at it. This is a this is a process which is ongoing, rather than suddenly, we're going to have a crisis, and the whole thing's going to end. Now, as you know, as everyone knows, your country, the UK, has decided to leave the European Union. Do you want to give us an update in the progress they've made with Brexit? I know just last week, um, uh, the UK's Prime Minister Theresa May was asking for the elections to be held sooner, so then um, Brexit negotiations would go more smoothly. So, did you want to give us an update on the state of Brexit right now? Yes, certainly. I mean, um, it. It didn't surprise me at all that uh, Theresa May called uh, an early general election. Uh, if I'd been in her shoes, uh, while the Labour Party, who were the main opposition, were in such disarray, I would have called an election as well. Um, it, will, it looks like she will have um, a majority which could be anything between 70 and 130 seats. So that will allow her to pursue Brexit um, uh, more constructively, with more authority as far as Brussels is concerned, because they will see that, uh, you know, politically she's in a very strong position rather than in a position of having to negotiate uh, back in the House of Commons in order to, to, to achieve a position. Uh, the other um, thing that's going to come out of this, I believe, is that some of the Scottish Nationalist Party are going to lose their seats in the House of Commons. Uh, and that will defuse um, a lot of the aggression out of Nicola Sturgeon, uh, who is continually pushing for, we've got to remain in the EU, we need, you know, we need to have our independence so that we can stay in the EU, all this sort of stuff. Um, it's not actually that convincing, but um, I think that uh, if 
Nicola Sturgeon was to lose or her party was to lose uh, something, anything between, say, uh, five and 15 seats in the House of Commons, then I think that would take the wind out of the nationalist sails. So you've got two very, very good reasons to have this now. Um, the other thing I think about it is that uh, with five years to run, um, the Boundary Commission does need to uh, look at how the constituencies are constructed and maybe reduce the number of Scottish seats in the House of Commons simply on the basis that powers have been transferred to uh, Edinburgh and there has been no reduction in the representation to take account of that and I would expect I mean if I was Theresa May I would I would be on that one and I would I would get the uh, boundary commission uh, to report on how uh, Westminster ought to be adjusted for the fact that um, uh, all these powers have been devolved to to Edinburgh and uh, uh, an awful lot of um, what goes on in Westminster has actually got absolutely nothing to do with Scotland. It is something that needs to be addressed. Of course, you can only really do that when you've got a decent majority for the very simple reason that, uh, you know, you get an awful lot of pushback from uh, the various vested interests who want to continue to have their representation in, uh, in Westminster. Now, just before we let you go, I was going to ask you one last thing. So even though Brexit hasn't officially, you know, gone through yet um, and, the UK is still part of the European Union right now. Has it impacted the economy, just, you know, the knowledge that that is what's going to happen at all? Well, the impact has been really absolutely predictable. Ahead of the Brexit vote, um, you know, businesses were lobbying hard for us not to leave the EU because, um, you know, businesses are businesses and that's the sort of thing they do. They're into lobbying rather than production, <laughs> as it were. Um, and uh, now that that is passed, you know, we've got to get on with life. So what happens? You find that people like uh, uh, Renault Nissan um, uh, are investing in um, a new, you know, a new um, uh, a Nissan car in Sutherland. It's the most efficient car plant in Europe. We have that in the northeast. Um, again, uh, General Motors have sold their uh, UK subsidiary to uh, um, a, a partially state-owned uh, French manufacturer. Um, we're finding that that all of the uh, companies that sort of turned around and said, "Well, I think it would be terrible if we, you know, if Britain left." Europe, they're investing again. So, uh, you know, in other words, they tried to lobby. The lobbying didn't work. They've got to get on with it. That's what's happening. The economy here has also been running pretty strongly. Things are pretty good here. And it's very, very simple. You know, when, when you know, people go about their business, we may not like the government, we may not like this, we may not like that. But at the end of the day, we go about our business. And, um, you know, consequently, all the sort of predictions that the UK economy would collapse if we voted Brexit, that's gone. So there is a new confidence, if you like, um, uh, in government as a whole. And um, the question now is, will they have the guts to pursue a genuine free trade agreement? If they did that, then I think this country would have a role in the world. Uh, and by that, I mean a role encouraging free trade. But if they um, if they bottle it, then I think it would be a great pity. It would be a mis it would be an opportunity missed. All right. Well, Alistair McLeod, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your time. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last insights and where can they find you online? Uh, I think I'll, I'll just leave it as to where you can find me online. Um, my writing appears on Gold Money under the Insights column. Um, so if you go to Gold Money and into the Wealth section, you'll find all our research there and my Insight articles, which are published every Thursday, sort of, I suppose, late morning um, Eastern time um, on Thursdays. Uh, you'll find me there. All right. Once again, thank you so much for your time, Alison. Um, I've had a look at the underlying numbers, and I can't even turn around and say that there's a someone's trying to corner the market or anything like that. It really doesn't look like that. But if you look at the underlying supply and demand for silver, uh, you can see that silver is demanded. Of that, there is no doubt. And there is probably not a lot of room for um, 
uh, investment interest in silver, as it were, uh, in in the physical. So um, it's it's a it's a funny old game, really, because silver is re- is you know maybe more aligned with uh, the base metals in the way it's moving, whereas gold is definitely monetary. And that at the moment is an extremely interesting situation with all the geopolitical stuff going on, plus the fact that uh, the interest rates, term interest rates in the United States have been falling recently. So gold is, I think, at a very in- interesting juncture at this moment. Now, I was wondering, um, do you, so what do you see for the silver market? The open interest is just going super high, but the price of silver isn't really reacting at all. So what do you see for the short-term future of the silver market? Do you know, I really don't know what to make of it. Um, what I do know, uh, moving away from the technicals in uh, the futures markets, is I do know that demand for silver is very strong. And it's very strong because China is buying up uh, raw materials, the base metals, uh, the metals it needs for industrial purposes, because it, it is expanding its economy at a fair clip. It, I mean, the re- recently they said that their economic growth was running at about 6.9%, which was better than anybody thought. I don't actually place too much credence on these figures, but I think it is indicative of the, of, uh, of the fact that the Chinese economy is actually growing quite strongly. Uh, they are also trying to get rid of um, uh, excess dollars and U.S. treasuries in return for physical uh, metals, um, energy, all those things because of their plans for developing the whole of Asia. So you can see that um, you know the demand for silver is there in the physical market. But what I can't quite uh, rationalize in my own mind is why the price isn't higher in the futures market, except possibly it has been depressed deliberately by uh, the bullion banks at someone's behest. Now, that I wouldn't know. That is getting into the realms of speculation. But it certainly smells as if the futures market is sitting on the price while we know that there is very good demand uh, out there from uh, particularly countries like China. And remember, China is now the largest um, uh, manufacturer of uh, solar panels. Uh, that market's increasing very, very sharply. Um, it's also used in chemicals for synthesizing chemicals. And that, again, is another area where China has been sort of pretty, pretty active. And China also refines an awful lot of silver. I, I, I expect also that um, we're seeing jewelry demand in places like India um, because of all the problems that uh, have been, um, uh, uh, if you like, brought about uh, on gold by uh, the Modi government. Perhaps the Indians are buying silver. Perhaps silver is being bought elsewhere as well, because it is seen in Asia as uh, as a form of money uh, and is therefore attractive on that um, on that basis. Definitely. Now, I'd like to discuss a little bit regarding the situation with Korea right now and how it might impact the precious metal markets. Now, just discussing the situation right now, you you've been saying that the Korean situation is escalating out of control and there might be no way to stop it. Can you expand on that? Well, um, I think more correctly, I said there is a risk that that is is that that is how it will be viewed. Um, I think that the North Korean situation is being um, pumped up by um, the U.S. government. Um, The fact of the matter is that the North Koreans will be perfectly happy to meet the Americans uh, on the basis that they become accepted more in the global community. We've had so many signals from North Korea that that's what they want. But it is the Americans that have refused to accommodate them, saying that they've got to uh, get rid of their nuclear weapons, they have to stop that program, and so on and so forth. So it's the Americans who are playing hardball. It's actually not the North Koreans. I would say that uh, Kim Jong-un is a very frightened, paranoid dictator. And uh, in that sense, he is probably unpredictable. But the situation could be resolved tomorrow by America just saying, well, you know, let's just back off for a moment. Let's consider this and perhaps let's have a conference and talk about support and increase in the debt ceiling is in a war situation. So if Trump can go to Congress and say, look, this there is a you know this is a war situation. Hopefully, it's not going to deteriorate into a war into, into a real war. But I need the I need the room in order 
to be able to um, to look after uh, America's interests. So that, you know, that I can see as being a very powerful argument because very few congressmen are going to stand in the way of, um, uh, if you like, the national interest in that sense. So um, uh, this is the way the Chinese strategists are looking at it. They see this as a war being manufactured by the United States to do two things. First of all, to increase the apparent risk on investments in the region. And we're talking about not North Korea, but South Korea and also uh, um, uh, Japan. And the second thing is that Trump needs to get Congress to agree to an increase in the debt limit. And in a war situation, they will agree a lot more readily than they would without, you know, in, in, in a peaceful situation. So that's, that, I think, is the explanation behind what's happening in North Korea. Now, hopefully that is right in the sense that um, it's going to go no further than is necessary, if you like, to achieve those two objectives. Um, but it is actually quite troubling in the sense that I think afterwards, uh, both Japan and South Korea will have seen that they have suffered very badly from these actions, which amount to absolutely nothing at the end of the day. And the thought that they will be on side with America in future, I think we've got to take a step back and say, well, their vested interest is to ditch America and actually go throw in their lot with China, which is which is growing rapidly. It's got far more interests. Furthermore, uh, Japanese co uh, companies have large investments in China. They've got a lot of manufacturing um, uh, capacity uh, in China and, and in Southeast Asia. The whole of that region is actually where Japan's focus increasingly is and will be. And I think the same is also true of South Korea. So I think, um, you know, this sort of idea of a strategy to pump and dump dollars um, and recover about it. That would give uh, Kim Jong-un the sense of importance that he feels he is lacking, the respect that he's lacking from the international community. So it's actually quite easy to solve. So this raises the question, why is America destabilizing the North, uh, North Korea and, and uh, if you like, the whole of that region? Because bear in mind that both Vladivostok and Beijing are within the nuclear fallout of anything that happens in North Korea. So uh, this is a situation which um, is actually looking pretty dangerous. Um, whether it escalates any further or not, we don't know. In the past, what tends to have happened is that you get a lot of saber rattling. You get a few missiles launched. Um, you know, perhaps they attack a fishing boat or something. Uh, they attack some, you know, they do something on the border with South Korea, which is seen as aggressive. And then the whole thing calms down. Um, I think that's what pe people are hoping this time. But I'm not too sure. I think the Americans are actually a bit more serious about this, which raises the question why they're doing it. And I think they're doing it for um, a an interesting reason, which has been uh, put up by the Chinese military strategists as uh, the way America behaves. Basically, um, America prints dollars for export, and um, it makes a lot of money out of printing dollars for export. Obviously, you've got the seniorage uh, of the raw of the raw stuff, and also you've got the seniorage, if you like, of the bank credit expansion, uh, where uh, U.S. banks lend uh, dollars. Now, uh, one of the regions in the world where there are lots of dollar dollars around is, of course, in the ownership of South Koreans and also um, uh, the Japanese. So. Um, uh, could it be that what America is now doing is that it needs to borrow um, dollars at, uh, without raising interest rates uh, in America because of the, the overall levy, level of outstanding debt? Um, now, it can do that by making everything else look risky compared with U.S. treasuries. So that's the first leg of it. The second leg of the, the argument is that uh, we're up against the debt ceiling, um, and that is uh, a very, very serious, hard uh, fact that, we're, that, that, that um, uh, Trump is facing at the moment. Um, however, the one way in which you'll get Congress speculators who tend to be bullish, um, if they're not bullish, they tend to have lower long positions on a net basis. And on the other side, you have the bullion banks who will 
um, tend to go short, and they can go short quite easily because it's just a question of expanding um, uh, their balance sheets. Um, they just go short. They can print contracts out of thin air. And usually what happens is they do that to the extent where they overwhelm uh, the the um, uh, uh, the hedge fund managers. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the price gets uh, driven down. Now, recently, we've had quite an interesting divergence between what's been going on in the gold market and what's been going on in the silver market. In the gold market, um, this level of... Um, uh, if you like, outstanding contracts, what we call open interest, has not built up to the sort of levels where you would expect uh, the the overall bullishness amongst the hedge fund fund managers to get out of control, out of proportion, and therefore vulnerable to a massive correction. That hasn't happened yet. But on the other hand, if you look at the silver market, uh, the open interest rate has recently been at record levels. I mean, you know, this, these, these are extremely high levels. They indicate that uh, the hedge funds are very, very long of silver. Uh, and there you would expect that there would be a shakeout because no bullion bank likes to sit on um, really enormous losses and losses building as more and more contracts. They issue more and more contracts on the short side to find that they're bought and the price still goes up. Now, in favor of the bullion banks, actually what's happened with silver is that the price has underperformed despite this enormous expansion in open interest rates. So uh, in open interest. So it, this is... Um, uh, a sort of rather unusual situation where on the one hand you would say in shorthand that gold is not yet overbought but on the other hand you would say that silver is very overbought i'm not quite sure what it means but i think what it does tell me about the gold market is that the gold market uh, has the potential to rise further before it gets into that overbought uh, technically overbought territory whereas the silver market there is something going on which i don't fully understand